Wordsworth and the Romantic Era, a presentation by Dr. Isra Deraise, joined by guest speaker Professor M. Keith Booker of the University of Arkansas. Today we're going to be talking on the Romantic Era in England. This era um, extends roughly from 1789 to the 1820s. Major um, events in history had um, influence on this movement, such as the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars, and um, uh, some interesting characteristics about this uh, movement is that it was uh, self-consciously modern and revolutionary throughout uh, uh, Europe. Uh, romantic poetry placed an unprecedented emphasis on the powers and terrors of the individual inner imagination. So we have here a literary movement that really focuses on the interior uh, self, uh, the imagination and what comes out of that. It explores the inner self, like I said, as did other phenomena of that period, such as, uh, such as biography, autobiography, and the confessional essay. So if you um, notice, all of these really focus on the idea of individualism. And um, going to our next point, this new emphasis on the self and the inner imagination led to a new emphasis on the author as the creator. So once you're like emphasizing uh, the individual, the self, then of course this also really focuses on the creator of this content. Uh, Professor Booker, um, uh, would uh, can you please tell us a little bit on how this is this movement also had an influence on um, uh, focusing on the author as the creator and how it basically also helped to emphasize individualism. Well, I think both of those two things go hand in hand. I mean, one of the reasons why they have such a focus on individualism is because they have this vision of the romantic poet as this kind of special, unique individual uh, who can see things that nobody else can see, who can express feelings that nobody else can uh, feel or express. Uh, and so uh, that's the that notion of the unique individual artist uh, is very central to romanticism and also very central to individualism. Um, Professor Booker, I have another question here. Since this movement came as a challenge to realism, which was really the major actually movement, um, and this one came to challenge it. Um, also, realism focuses on the individual character, like if you're reading a novel um, by any of the realist uh, writers of um, uh, the 19th century, for example, we always have a central um, character, and so there is this um, emphasis on um, individualism. So what marks the individualism in romanticism from the individualism and realism? Uh, nothing, actually. Uh, the Romantics envisioned themselves as opponents of realism because they thought the rise of the realist novel in the 18th century as the dominant genre in England was somehow lowering literature to the level of basically journalism mm -hmm. uh, and wasn't really artistic uh, anymore uh, and was, you know, was again emphasizing uh, rational thought instead of passion like the Romantics wanted to emphasize, and so they envisioned themselves as going against uh, literary realism. Uh, but unfortunately, the way they did it was uh, so thoroughly informed by individualism that ultimately the ideology of romantic poetry is not that different from the ideology of the realist novel, because both of them still end up being uh, very uh, centrally informed by the notion of individualism that each human individual is different and unique and special and important, uh, and that, that that's, the, that's really the unit, if you will, of humanity mm -hmm. that we need to think in terms of is the individual person. Okay, and so actually one of them really focuses on how that corresponds with scientific inquiries and like real characters in real life. For example, they're like, you know, it mirrors that, 
And then here, when it comes to romanticism, it kind of really focuses on the imagination and the, the unconscious mind, right, of that person or that uh, individual. Absolutely. Okay, let's move to our next slide. Um, Professor Booker is going to tell us a little bit about German Romanticism and why it is important and the difference between it and the um, um, English uh, Romanticism. Uh, thanks. Uh, since we're going to be really talking only about English Romanticism today, uh, I wanted at least at the beginning to make the point that there was a, also an extremely important Romantic movement uh, in Germany, uh, which actually predated uh, the uh, Romantic movement in England, uh, starting as early as 1774 with the publication of Goethe's The Sorrows of Young Werther. Uh, there, is a, uh, there are a number of differences, though, between German Romanticism and uh, English Romanticism, to the point that the two were almost independent of one another as movements, mm -hmm. and really there wasn't a whole lot of cross-influence. Uh, for one thing, German Romanticism was dominated by philosophers, uh, not by uh, poets or, or writers of other kinds. Uh, jo uh, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe was, was the most important literary figure uh, of German Romanticism, and really he was probably the most important figure of the whole 19th century in German literature. Uh, but in some ways he really wasn't uh, a dominant figure in German Romanticism. Uh, which was dominated by philosophers like Schilling and Scheller and people like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's worth keeping in mind that uh, Romanticism can exist in different forms in different places and that the characterization that we'll be putting forth today strictly applies only to English Romanticism. Yeah, and I think that they will probably have a glance on that and these kind of differences when we get to E.T. Um, a. Hoffman. Uh, the Sandman. Okay. Yeah, since you're doing the Hoffman, it is, that, that's another reason why it's important to at least be aware of German Romanticism. Exactly. Now, the central idea, like we said, that we're focused on by talking on the Romantic movement and uh, the um, poetry uh, that we're going to discuss, uh, the English poetry that we're going to discuss, is the idea of the Romantic poet. Who is the Romantic poet and what is his role? So this Romantic uh, poet is seen as um, the author who is the source of poetry um, through his or her own individual inspired internal reaction to the external world. Um, the individual poet was also seen as connected to his or her poetry as never before. So he's um, uh, so when the author created an uh, autobiographical persona uh, with within his or her own writing, we get to see that um, uh, insight uh, and the connection, the, the real connection between this uh, poet and his uh, work. Uh, the romantic author was also seen as this original genius who's ahead of his or her time. So um, he's possessed by a mysterious and inexplicable power of imagination and creati creativity. And so he really cannot explain how he possesses this um, uh, gift, if you may. And so, um, and through that gift of insight that he has and that connection that he has between the external world and um, whatever goes through his mind and his imagination, we get something, uh, the fruit of that is something that's like really creative and special. So this notion of the author as the source of literature has remained powerful um, ever since. And so we still have that focus and that emphasis on the author being this uh, great creator and it really kind of dates uh, from that time. Um, if you want to add anything, Professor Booker. Well, I think it is important to recognize that even though the Romantic movement was relatively short-lived, uh, that it has had a lasting influence uh, in a number of ways. And that idea that the author is sort of the, the uh, source of literature, that it just originates in his head and springs forth mm -hmm. from there, uh, is uh, still very powerful. Which, And, of course, that goes along with the notion that uh, it's really important to be creative and original 
uh, as a writer of literature. That's something that really only started with the romantics. Mm -hmm. uh, to some extent, that's also part of the realist novel in, in uh, the 18th century, but uh, it definitely comes uh, through more clearly, more forcefully uh, in romantic poets. Before that, uh, before the 18th century, really literature was not a matter of creativity. It was a matter of craftsmanship and what you tried Mimicking. to do. Mm -hmm. was mimic previous writers who had been already acknowledged as great writers. So you say, well, if I can write like them, then I'll be a great writer too. Uh, and there really wasn't any value placed on, on originality at all uh, until the 18th century. And really in the 18th century, the only reason originality became important was because the novel was the first l literary form that was uh, a commodity. That is, it was uh, manufactured and sold uh, to uh, individual buyers mm -hmm. uh, in large numbers uh, and obviously you want some originality then because if your books are like everybody else's there won't be any reason for people to buy your books so you want your book to be different so people want to buy it but the romantics were much more serious and, uh, and passionate about the idea that originality was really uh, what literature was for and that because they thought of the author as some, somehow as a unique individual, something that originated within his mind would be different from anything else that had ever been before. Exactly. So there are many schools of thought that challenged the uh, romantic notion of authorship and emphasis on the author as this like a great, uh, you know, source of the information that he creates or that, um, you know, poetry that he writes. So um, one of these schools is the American New Criticism, uh, the New Critics, who uh, they were really influential in the 1950s and they argued that readers should arrive to meaning of whatever text that they're reading on um, any text, like I said, uh, without ever having to go back to the author. So you should be able to interpret and just going by the words that are on the page and you really shouldn't have the author there uh, to add to the interpretation or the meaning of what you're reading. So that's new criticism. And then we have psychoanalysis criticism that basically argues that much of the artistic creation actually and inspiration that happens, it really comes from the unconscious mind of the author. And so since it comes from the unconscious mind, it really cannot there be attributed to the conscious intentions of the author. And Professor Booker is gonna uh, explain this point a little bit for us. Yeah, I think one of the things that's special about the, the romantic idea of inspiration is that they felt that because they were these unique individual geniuses, they could consciously create this original art that no one had ever conceived of before. The psychoanalytic criticism would argue that no, they weren't really consciously creating it. It was just coming to them from their unconscious minds and they didn't realize it. Uh, but I think, again, one of the responses to that that the romantics themselves might have had is, well, Maybe that's the case, but maybe what really is going on is that I have special access to my unconscious mind as a, a genius, as a romantic poet, uh, and therefore I can sort of draw on that uh, energy uh, more directly and, and more forcefully than other people can, so that you have this sense of a direct connection between the conscious mind and the unconscious mind. So I, in a way, I think they could almost uh, uh, adopt the... Uh, vision of psychoanalytic criticism, but then adapt it to their own particular vision. Exactly. Um, there are uh, major critics, such as Roland Barth, uh, who argued the idea of the death of the author in a major essay uh, by him. Um, and it really uh, talks about um, how um, important, basically, is the author really when you are uh, reading or analyzing um, uh, any uh, literary uh, work, and so and how mm, to which to uh, to which extent does uh, that author have control over his um, uh, vision or the vision that he actually creates. 
And so he argues that the author is not really the source of meaning. Um, he mainly draws upon pre-existing um, a set of meanings. So a discourse that is already there, okay? And then you just basically, you know, choose from that and you assemble that uh, meaning um, in new ways. And so uh, the discourse is there, the meanings are already there, and you just basically um, uh, draw upon it in making your own uh, writing or text. Um, any any comment on that, Professor Rohi? Well, I, you know, one of the things that they say about his model is that he views every text as a patchwork of quotations from mm -hmm. other texts. So mm -hmm. that, that's, that's a good phrase, I think, to keep in mind if you're trying to picture what's going on here. But the idea is that the author, I mean, the author's still important to an extent, but not as important as the Romantics would believe. Mm -hmm. But in particular for Bart, the author is not the originator uh, of the text. As you said, he's just the assembler of bits and pieces of pre-existing uh, material. Exactly. Um, there is the reader response um, that's also uh, attributed uh, wrongly to Bart. Uh, if you want to comment on that. Well, I mean, reader response criticism definitely goes very much against uh, the romantics in the sense that it argues that the reader is really the person that creates meaning. Mm -hmm. If you have a, a poem, you know, written on a page of paper and it's sitting on the table and nobody's reading it, how can it be doing anything, right? It's not creating any kind of... Uh, and, and I uh, think that it also comes from the fact that every reader comes to the text with his own background, his own set of background, his experiences, his life. And so you really kind of interpret things based on what you already have in mind. Yeah, so the reader becomes the person who creates the meaning of the text and gives it life. Mm -hmm. uh, this is really not the kind of criticism that Barth did, though. I think the one thing that's related to reader response criticism in Barth's work uh, is uh, he envisions certain kinds of literary text. There's one kind that he calls the readerly text, which is sort of the opposite of what it sounds like. The readerly text is dominated by the writer. That's the way the romantics thought they were doing. They were dominating mm -hmm. their text. They were creating this powerful meaning, and their readers were supposed to just receive it. Uh, so the readerly text is one in which the reader just acts like a reader. You know, you just mm -hmm. receive the information. But Bard also talked about the writerly text in which the reader does act like a writer uh, and creates meaning himself. On the other hand, the agency still here lies with the author. I mean, for, for Bart, authors intentionally create either readerly or writerly text, depending on whether or not they want their readers to just receive their message or whether or they want the readers to, you know, create their own message. Yeah, that's true. And then we have Jock Jurda, who argued that language itself is so indeterminate in meaning. And basically the author really does not have control over his text that he creates because, you know, language can mean all sort of different things. And um, uh, so any comment on that? I mean, I think it's clear. Well, yeah, Derrida, of course, is the, the, the most important practitioner of what came to be known as deconstruction, deconstruction. Uh, in the 1970s, yes. uh, where a very popular form of uh, literary uh, theory or theory of the reading of literary texts uh, was uh, basically to just look at text uh, with a, an eye on the ind potential indeterminacy of the language. And basically you just reveal that uh, no matter what text you read, if you look closely enough at it, eventually you'll find some place where its meaning is actually indeterminate. And so that you can never really have one final reading of any text that's the correct reading. Exactly. Okay, so um, today we're mainly going to be talking, um, we're only actually going to be talking on William Wordsworth, who lived from 1770 to 1850. He is one of the most important British Romantic poets. And you see here a picture of a, a fairly old Wordsworth, but it's worth keeping in mind that the poems that, uh, of Wordsworth that are best known were all written before he was 30 years old. Exactly. And so Wordsworth, I mean, something we're going to learn 
uh, about him moving forward is that um, yeah he wrote his poetry mainly before the age of 30 and spent the rest of his life really revising that uh, poetry and rewriting it and we're gonna see how and why so um, much of his work is associated with his life at Dove Cottage um, Dove Cottage is a place um, uh, that um, where Wordsworth uh, lived um, he lived there to uh, basically contemplating and writing in peace because it's in a rural area um, and it's a countryside uh, of the uh, surrounding lake district and he wrote there because that's where he sought inspiration from nature so it's in the midst of nature um, activity one on page 12 and 13 in your book can give you a good idea of the role of that cottage in wordsworth career because i mean it's really the the source of inspiration for a lot of um, his poetry and in developing his reputation as a romantic poet um, also dove cottage was a key towards worth development of his own poetic persona what is a persona it's a voice or a perspective that is adopted by an author to express a particular point of view through his um, or her writing. Um, uh, Wordsworth had a long career, like we already said. Uh, he really lived um, to, a, to. How old was he when he died? Eight. He lived eight. for 80 years. Mm -hmm. 80 years. And so he really wrote most of his poetry before the age of 30 and spent the rest of his career revising that poetry and the persona because um he really believed that as a human being um grows older you evolve and you change and so you become every time like when you're as you're aging you become a completely different uh, person and so uh, it's worth really changing that uh, perspective or that uh, persona because you're just like really um, looking back at things in a different mode, right? Is that true? Right, and you can see that in the, the poems that he wrote in his 20s. The speaker in the poems, which is his persona, uh, is generally, you know, the sort of passionate young man. Uh, and then in uh, his later poetry, uh, which much of which, as you pointed out, was mm -hmm. revision uh, of earlier poetry. Uh, in his later poetry, though, he adopts the voice uh, as he, you know, is, is appropriate of this kind of wise old mm -hmm. man. Now he's, he's maybe not quite as passionate. He still feels things strongly, uh, but uh, he, you know, keep in mind the Romantic movement itself had been over for 20 years by the time he died. And so he himself, I think, was drifting away from the Romantic movement and more into this kind of contemplative stage instead of all this emphasis on passion and creativity. Here is Dove Cottage, and right now it's a Wordsworth Museum, and that is the source, basically, of most of Wordsworth's uh, poetry. Um, now we're going to look at one of um, Wordsworth's poems that's like really the most important uh, poem by him, I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud. But before we look at that, we're going to look at major characteristics of um, uh, reading poetry and like uh, technical characteristics really on how to read uh, uh, poems. So uh, diction and vocabulary are the language that are used by the poet in a poem. We have meter and rhythm, uh, the place and pattern of that poem as it moves through time. Then we have rhyme, creating special effects by rhyming the words at the end of the lines. Alliteration, using beginning sounds that are similar in words that are near each other. Assonance, using similar vowel sounds in words that are near each other. And we're going to see these um, characteristics, technical characteristics, are really what distinguishes poetry from other kinds of writing. But 
these are really simple um, characteristics and uh, we're going to see how they are employed in uh, Wordsworth uh, uh, poem. Yeah, I think one of the things that makes it special about the way we read poems is what they call the convention of significance. Mm -hmm. uh, whenever you see anything in a poem, it must be significant. There must be some reason why it's there. So exactly. all of these, all of these technical things that you've talked about that are tools of the poet, uh, the convention for reading poetry is that, okay, when you see alliteration, when you see a certain kind of meter or rhyme, when you see assonance, what's the significance of this? You assume it must be, the poet must be doing that for a reason, and in a way, your job as the reader of the poem is to try to determine what that reason uh, might be, or at least the, certainly the romantics would want you to read their poetry that way. That, yes, that's true. Um, so, like I said, this is um, the most famous um, uh, poem by Wordsworth. Um, it has um, different names. Like we said, Wordsworth tended to kind of you know do revisions on his poetry and change sometimes in the content sometimes even the titles of his um poetry and so here we have it as i wandered lonely as a cloud and in other um versions of it it's called the daffodil um so uh professor booker if you want to go ahead and read it to us uh, i wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high or vales and hills when all at once i saw a crowd a host golden daffodils beside the lake beneath the trees 10,000 dancing in the breeze okay so now we're going to read this poem um, um, line by line using the new criticism uh, method um, but before we begin um, I want to indicate that this is a first person lyric poem um, which means it's a short poem that focuses on a single idea or a feeling. Um, the lyric poem is spoken by an I, so it's like it's just a one single person. Um, and then some, uh, somewhere in the, in the poem, the persona is revealed as the uh, poet of this poem, so it's a Wordsworth uh, persona. And the language in this poem is really simple, direct and clear, and although it's really simple and direct and clear, it's still um, considered a very um, important uh, uh, poem because it really um, shows the real Wordsworth, right? Uh, I think this is a very representative Wordsworth poem, yes. Exactly. So... Um, this poem is written in lines of four iambic feet per line. Uh, it's considered a simple yet effective um, meter. Um, if you want to read the, these lines and just like, you know, show the difference of the, okay. yeah. Let, let's recall what an iamb is. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's two syllables, the first of which is not stressed, the second of which is stressed. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you can see here on the slide how they're marked. The, the unstressed ones are an X and the stressed ones are a slash. Exactly. So if you go through and just sort of exaggerate to pick up on the rhythm, you would say, I wandered lonely mm -hmm. as a cloud. Uh, and that, and that again, as you said, it's a very effective meter. It kind of drives you forward through the lines and it just keeps things moving with that nice rhythm uh, and th this is probably the most common uh, meter that was used in English poetry when English poetry did use meters I mean English poetry now generally it's just free verse and doesn't have a set meter uh, yeah. metrical pattern uh, but the IAM for example was used in almost all of Shakespeare's poetry though he usually had five feet per line uh, instead of four so it was called iambic pentameter pentameter Um, so the rhyme scheme also in this poem is um, simple um, and reinforces the uh, wording of the poem. Um, we have an AB, AB, and then we have the couplet um, at the end. Uh, they end with CC, and uh, 
this is the way that it ends. It really just shows it allows a is true like a strong uh, ending uh, for uh, in rhyme. And you can see how these last two lines go together in meaning uh, as well. He sort of has mm -hmm. set up the situation in the first four lines that's kind of uncertain, and so it seems appropriate to be moving from one uh, end uh, sound to another. So you go A B A B, almost like you're going back and forth. But then you reveal the, the, the actual meaning of what you're talking about in the end in these last two lines. And so they rhyme with each other just to make that point more strongly. Very true. Um, now we're going to do what I already said, reading um, the poem using the new criticism uh, style. Um, so we're looking at this without any reference to the um, writer or his background and we're trying to determine meaning and know what these lines mean and draw on the actual lines without having any uh, looking at the background of the author. So first I begin with the first line, I wandered lonely as a cloud. And so here we have um, uh, the line establishing the fact that the speaker is a loner. He's away from uh, people not surrounded by people. And then he uses a simile here, um, uh, an effective um, uh, uh, characteristic of poetry, but yet it's like really um, simple. So he says uh, here, lonely as a cloud. Um, so like I said, it establishes the fact that the language is poetic, but really um, simple. And so the speaker here is comparing himself to a cloud and here basically that poem reveals that it's about a connection between um, a human uh, speaker and nature second line Go that ahead. floats on high or vales and hills uh, and you can see uh, again this emphasis on nature uh, that he's uh, He's sort of like a cloud floating and looking down on the landscape uh, in nature, but he describes the landscape as veils, uh, which really just means fields. Basically, you know, it would have been more straightforward to say fields and hills, but it wouldn't have sounded as good uh, poetically. So he says veils and hills, partly to make it sound good and partly, again, just to sort of announce that this is a poem. This is, uh, I'm, I'm going to be using poetic language. Same thing with the poetic or instead of over which helps the metrical pattern of the line, uh, but also, again, just sort of identifies it uh, as uh, poetry. It's true. Then in this line, he says, when all at once I saw a crowd. And so you're suddenly, you know, this line here creates a moment of surprise because we know that this is a lone speaker. He's alone. There's nobody around him. He's in a remote country setting. Um, and then now what is happening? Um, how is he suddenly met with a crowd? Not one person, not two people. He's met with a crowd. And it really ends at the end of this line, which really creates that, like, you know, tension um, that you want to know who is this crowd. And so this is generally created for the purpose of a dramatic, um, uh, to create a dramatic effect. And it really uh, helps with the uh, suspense where the reader wants to go to the next line and wants to know who is this crowd that the um, uh, person is uh, running into. Next. And so we end the other line with a crowd and then he continues a host. Uh, of golden daffodils. A host is basically just a really big crowd. And so he's, he's basically just strengthening. So he ends that line with this really surprising uh, idea that there's a crowd here and then reinforces it at the beginning of the next line by saying a host. Uh, but then he, after a, a brief pause uh, signified by the comma, he says of golden daffodils. So now you're like, oh, okay, I, now I get it. He's still out in nature. He's just talking about flowers. It's a crowd, a host of flowers, not of people. Exactly. Uh, and this, this technique of setting up an expectation uh, at the end of one line and driving you 
next line, but then upending that expectation with something uh, that's not what you thought it was going to be is, is a, a very common poetic technique in English poetry. It's something that John Milton, for example, was especially well known for in things like Paradise Lost. Mm -hmm. Here's a picture of um, daffodils. Um, those flowers are considered um, a sign of nature's renewal because they are the first uh, flowers to bloom um, in spring. And so uh, those are the flowers that the uh, poet is uh, referring to. Um, if you would like to tell us a little bit more on daffodils, because well, they, the these daffodils are... Really are Daffodils really are kind of special because here in Arkansas, as they do in England, we have four real seasons and mostly deciduous trees. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in the winter, you know, the trees are bare, there's no leaves, the grass is brown, and no flowers, everything's just kind of blah and almost dead seeming. And then when the spring comes, you know, you get this renewal and the grass turns green and the leaves come back on the trees and all these things happen. But the first thing that happens is the daffodils bloom. That's like in the middle of March. And that's kind of the first real sign you get uh, of spring. So it's always a, a, a nice event. I have some daffodils in my backyard. And mm -hmm. it's always kind of reassuring when those daffodils bloom. Like, oh, spring really is coming. Exactly true. I remember like, yeah, back in Arkansas, like you would have this very dreary um, like winter and it's like really cold and like you feel like really nothing in nature is going to ever bloom ever again. And then suddenly you would see those um, daffodils like beginning to bloom and that's just like the first sign no like spring is going to be back. And so and they really are everywhere in Fayetteville. I've never lived anywhere where they had so many daffodils as they do in Fayetteville. It's yeah. like the town flower. Exactly, and they're definitely gorgeous. All right, now we go back to a line where it has that m moment of peace, no surprise. And so it says here, beside the lake, beneath the trees. Now, like I said, we're back to that, you know, situation of um, calmness. Uh, no twists, no surprise, there are nobody else here. And uh, so generally a line like this would come after two lines that have that great suspense. We had um, a crowd and then we had in that other line um, a host and like, and then now we get back to a line that just we know it's all na nature, nature that the, the author, the persona is in nature. And so we're co kind of going back and returning to that scene of tranquility. It's a rural countryside and it's really away from people. And so a line like this is generally considered a line of rest. And so it helps to emphasize the peacefulness of that scene. Next. 10,000 dancing in the breeze. And again, there's not, you know, he didn't count them. He doesn't know there's 10,000. It's just, a, a, again, uh, it's what they sometimes call poetic license. You, know, you say mm -hmm. things that aren't quite uh, accurate just to make a point. Uh, and so 10,000 just means there's a lot of them. But what's also important in this line is, uh, again, another uh, case of personification uh, where he uh, pictures these flowers, you know, they're kind of swaying in the breeze, the wind's blowing them, and, and daffodils do move uh, nicely in the wind. Uh, and, he, and he just envisions them as dancing, which conveys this kind of uh, sense of joy, a sense of celebration. Uh, but again, it's something we normally associate with human beings and not with flowers. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he's linking the human uh, and the natural, as the romantic poets love to do. Exactly. Um, so now we read the first stanza, um, new criticism um, style, and I would encourage you to read the second uh, stanza in the same uh, way. Um, so here is the second stanza, and like I said, I would encourage you to interpret it in the exact same way that we did the first stanza. Uh, 
Yeah, you can see a lot of the same material in the second stanza, except that the emphasis is now a little bit more on the poet and his feelings and his reactions. So, the, you know, he set the scene in the first stanza. And now in the next scene, he's going to give us his reaction to uh, the thing, uh, the scene. But uh, again, it, it's very much in the same style, very much, you know, has the same rhyme scheme, has the mm -hmm. same meter, uh, the same kind of simple language. Uh, that and you know lots of personification. Now the daffodils, for example, in this stanza are laughing uh, instead of dancing. But again, it's it's kind of conveys that sense of happiness. Exactly, and it, um, as Professor Booker has noted, that since the second stanza really focuses on the emotions of the um, poet rather than the, actually that scene and how happy he is and uh, like how he feels when he is. Um, um, reacting to such a scene, this really makes you think that um, Wordsworth creation of such a strong um, poetic persona just forces sometimes an, a, a biographical reading and uh, you would feel like you may want to go and um, look at his life and know more about um, Wordsworth's life to kind of help you um, interpret the poem and have a better understanding of why he feels those type of emotions when he is in, uh, in, in nature and why actually specifically Dove Cottage because like we said he really um, draws upon the natural scene surrounding that cottage and um, he really feels that he gets uh, his um, 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 his inspiration from uh, there and from that uh, place. And so your textbook includes an example of a, a journal um, from Wordsworth's sister who has a direct description of um, a scene around uh, Dove uh, Cottage that is really similar to uh, Wordsworth's poem. And it's in Activity 3, page 18 to 20 in your book. Uh, do you have any comment on that? Uh, not really. I think we can go forward. Okay. Uh, so having looked at that poem, uh, among other things, uh, we can learn a lot about Wordsworth's whole career from this one poem because it is, as we said, so representative uh, of his work. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the reasons why this is his best known poem uh, is, is because it, it, it sort of contains all the classic Wordsworthian uh, moves, the simple language, the communion with nature, that sort of thing. In fact, the, this, the classic Wordsworth moment is when the poet is out alone in nature, separated from people, but inspired by his natural surroundings. Uh, and Wordsworth himself, uh, I, I think, found inspiration in that way. Uh, in the area around Dove Cottage. Uh, but he also seemed to feel a little bit guilty. We'll talk about this more as we go forward, mm -hmm. that maybe this was, you know, it was too nice and too peaceful, and there's all these troubles out in the world. There were a lot of troubles in England at the time. Uh, and, uh, you know, in some ways he felt like he, he like most of the, the romantic uh, poets in England were, were political radicals. Uh, and Wordsworth uh, started, really became a poet in, under the inspiration of the French Revolution and mm -hmm. hoped to bring about some kind of revolutionary change in England. But when that uh, sort of point of view became very unpopular uh, in England, it was clear that the revolution wasn't going to spread from France to England. Wordsworth just kind of retreated with Dorothy to uh, uh, this you know, remote country cottage, Dove Cottage, and just sort of uh, divorced himself from the political scene in London and elsewhere for, for years, really. And, but he did constantly sort of think to himself, is it, is it really appropriate for me to just be hanging out here in all this natural beauty and getting inspired when maybe I should be actually in London where the action is? Yeah, and we're actually going to see um, this mode of questioning in his poem, Point um, a Rash Judgment. So let's move to that. So major um, uh, key points on this poem 
that it describes the uh, joy of wandering through nature, typical of Wordsworth. Um, again, around Dove Cottage. Um, it's a pastoral poem um, uh, or a poem about the idyllic nature of country life. And Professor Booker just like explained that and how he found his inspiration in nature and what it means. But again, he questions that type of isolation and whether it is an uh, appropriate of a poet to do that, to divorce yourself, to disconnect yourself from the reality of what's happening to the rest of the world. Um, Professor Booker pointed out that this was a time of turmoil and we had a collapse of um, uh, the French Revolution. Uh, and so at this time there was a turn to con conservatism uh, in England and uh, so uh, someone like Wordsworth and a lot of the other romantic poets who were great advocates um, of uh, the French Revolution were really left in a very um, questionable um, place or they were just like unpopular uh, because of where they stood in terms of their ideas and their political status and how they actually uh, were supporters of um, uh, that kind of change to uh, be uh, in England. And that is why, uh, that is one of the main reasons why he uh, left the city and went and found refuge in a place like Dove um, uh, Cottage. And so um, the poet in this, or the persona, the uh, voice in this poem, uh, this person who arrives in a new place um, and he a new area and is wondering he's a stranger and is wondering is it possible to basically claim this area as my home would that be possible and um, it's n worth noting here that probably this is a rhetorical question and that probably Wordsworth it's not really a question of being able to make Dove of Dove Cottage a home, but it's just that natural thing that um, romantic poets have, of that they always feel like they're tortured souls, and that they always should not feel too comfortable because if you're feeling too comfortable, it means that you really are not in uh, contact with your imagination and with your insights to the rest of the world and the external, uh, like, you know, connecting the external and the internal and uh, uh, how, you know, we said at the beginning that they have, they, the, they are these geniuses who know and have insight into things uh, better than the rest of the world. Any comment on that? No, I think you covered it well. So the brothers, the poem, the brothers also have uh, that similar motif of questioning uh, the responsibility of uh, uh, divorcing yourself from reality and secluding yourself in a natural scene that might be too comfortable for uh, you. Um, and also discusses the idea of the nature of home. It's included in reading one uh, three uh, uh, on pages 140 to 151 in your uh, textbook. Um, also, uh, an explanation of it uh, is on activi in Activity 5, pages 25 to 26 in your books. This poem is considered a narrative poem. What do we mean when we say narrative? It tells a story. So it's a story about a long absent brother who returns to his original home. He goes to find work. Um, he stays uh, away from his home for a long time. He comes back. He finds out that everything there is completely changed. The brother, his brother, uh, that he was thinking about the whole time he was away, he comes home to find out that he's uh, been dead for a long time right now. And he actually died a very sad uh, death. Sleep, uh, he was always sleepwalking and searching for his brother. And actually, like, because he was so miserable and he missed his brother, uh, he ultimately um, uh, dies. And so this poem here, and then the one who actually tells this story to the brother is a priest who is not originally from that area. He's a stranger who comes to 
that area and lives in it and apparently he just feels like you know he's comfortable there and he feels like it is home for him and then the brother who actually comes back to that home that was originally where his point of origin if you may okay completely feels that when he's go when he's back he actually feels that he doesn't belong there and he feels like he's just you know an uprooted person who's just like you know doesn't feel like he belongs and so here um professor booker is going to tell us a little bit on how what i just said comments on the growing sense of uh, um, uh, a modernity that was happening and a growing sense of not feeling that you belong in the face of a rapidly modernizing england and so how everything in that area or in the West was really subject to a rapid change that was happening and that was really certainly a disorienting experience for people. Yeah. Yeah, what Wordsworth's describing here is a very modern experience. I mean, through most of English history, uh, if you were, say, born in a certain place and then you left when you were reaching adulthood and maybe stayed gone for 30 or 40 years and came back, it would be exactly the way you it was when you left it. They, there really was very, very little uh, sense of change through time. Uh, but by the end uh, of the 18th century, uh, when Wordsworth is beginning his career as a poet, uh, England is in this uh, tremendous uh, sense of flux and transition uh, where the society is changing dramatically. Lots of people are moving from the country to the cities where you're beginning to have this first stirrings of the Industrial Revolution. Mm -hmm. uh, and just, you know, you just suddenly have now have developed this notion that things do change over time. So not only do things change, but you expect them to change. It's not a surprise that they change, but still it can be, as you can see in this poem, sometimes a little uh, difficult to come to grips with because especially if you grew up in a place, you get this very strong sense of what that place is like that sort of stays with you in your memory uh, and then when you go back to the place and discover that it's no longer the way that uh, you've been envisioning it, uh, then that can be quite a jolt. At the sure. same time, if it's, even if you stay in the same place, though, in this modern era, uh, the world's not going to be the same. The place is not going to be the same uh, as when you're 50, say, as it was when you were 20. So, so even though you stay in the same place, you're not really staying in the same place uh, because that place is no longer the same place over time. It's continually being uh, renewed. Exactly. That's true. All right. Um, lyrical Ballads, um, 1798 and The Recluse. Major works by um, Wordsworth. Um, um, when actually Wordsworth um, uh, published um, the lyrical ballads, he really um, became uh, prominent. Um, it's a collection of poems uh, by Wordsworth and his friend Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Um, in 1800, after uh, moving to Dove Cottage, he basically started revising uh, his portion that he wrote of that lyrical ballads. And again, this shows you that Wordsworth's um, uh, personal uh, um, character of um, uh, a person who just like kind of, you know, does all these revisions on everything he wrote just because he always believes that as you grow older, you are a completely changed person and thus you have a completely different perspective than the one you had before. And that is why he just kind of undertook that major um, uh, revision of his uh, portion. He also uh, worked at that um, simultaneously on a major philosophical poem that was called The Recluse, and he died before it was ever uh, finished with it. Uh, and, and then later on, parts of it were uh, eventually published. Um, then we go to his poem, H Home at Grasmere. It's reading one uh, four in your textbook, published only in 1888. Uh, after uh, long after Wordsworth actually was already um, dead, it was conceived as a sort of prospectus of for this uh, project. Yeah, I, I think it would be impossible to uh, 
uh, overstate how important Lyrical Ballads is. It's one of the most important books ever published uh, in uh, the English language in terms of its contribution to the history of poetry. Uh, this was the, po the book that not only made both Wordsworth and Coleridge important poets, but really sort of uh, put kicked the Romantic movement in England into gear. There had been people like William Blake who were sort of gesturing toward Romanticism mm -hmm. before Wordsworth and Coleridge, but Lyrical Ballads is really where you can locate the, the true beginning of uh, the Romantic movement in England. True. And now we're looking at Home uh, at Grasmere, which contains uh, some of Wordsworth's most effective descriptions of, again, the area around Dove Cottage. It's uh, the, the picture of it, the picture that is drawn is that how it's some sort of pastoral paradise. Um, this poem also, again, gestures toward uh, those anxieties um, uh, that Wordsworth had uh, about the irresponsibility of withdrawing into a setting that is, you know, calming, relaxing, uh, when the world is undergoing so many troubles and injustices. I mean, because uh, we already explained that was an era of turmoil uh, that was happening around that time. And so ultimately, in this poem, Wordsworth or the um, uh, resolves, the poem resolves that question um, about whether it is uh, responsible to withdraw and leave that entire world behind. And I really think that Wordsworth uh, basically decides that, yeah, it is responsible. And if I really help if I really can help the world to be a better place, I really can do that through my poetry, right? Yeah, I think he, he came, he eventually concluded that that was the way that he could make the most contribution. Mm -hmm. Not only could he make a contribution, but he could make more of a contribution uh, through his poetry than any way else. Exactly, exactly. The Prelude by Wordsworth is considered one of his master works. It was written in 1799, but then Wordsworth spent the remainder of his life um, uh, revising it. Um, it is an autobiographical uh, poem. It tells his story um, about his life uh, um, up to 1799 when he was uh, 29 years old. Um, it really focuses on how Wordsworth developed into being this mature uh, poet who's in full command of his powers. And um, it really is uh, of a kind of meditation on the nature of poetry and poets in general. Yeah, I think the prelude is uh, a really uh, interesting work. I mean, it's it's not as well known among just general readers as something like I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud, but for, you know, like professional Wordsworth scholars, the prelude is really where all the action is because it's, it, it's so serious and so profound and has so much sort of philosophy of poetry uh, in it, for one thing, but also because of the way it changes. I mean, it, these weren't slight revisions. You know, he's, he's again, in... In 1799, he's telling the story of his life up to age 29 when he's 29. But by the time, you know, he gets to the end of his life, he's telling the story of his life up to age 29 still, but he's looking at it from the point of view of being 79. Uh, and so scholars have found this very fascinating to, just to watch the evolution of this text and how differently he sees his young self as he moves through life and gets older and older and continually revises the poem. Uh, you know, a lot of people will find that frustrating because you want to say, well, which is the real poem? I want to read the prelude. <laughs> but yeah, there isn't any exactly. One. It's a moving target. And that's his purpose, really. It's just that there isn't one prelude and there isn't one Wordsworth. And yeah, as you evolve and like if it shows his evolution as an artist, as a person, it just um, kind of um, shows a strong fascination with... Um, uh, with the working of the inner uh, self, and that's the romantic self, of course. Uh, 
Um, and so the prelude contains many meditations on the nature of the self, that, that self, that, and what that self endures over uh, time and what changes in you and how do you evolve. And uh, so ultimately that endurance is achieved partly through the act of remembering. And so when he looks back, as he revises that poetry, he's revising it through the act of memory and what he remembers. Um, this focus was strongly influenced by uh, the Confessions of Jean-Jacques uh, Rousseau, published in 1781, uh, 82, sorry, a detailed introspective account of Rousseau's inner um, life. And Professor Gopher is going to tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I think that's one of the ironies uh, of the prelude in a way, is that even though it's all about the poetic creativity and originality, uh, it was very strongly inspired by a specific predecessor text, Rousseau's Confessions, uh, which were... Uh, uh, Rousseau was a fairly important philosopher. He's more of a philosopher than a, a literary writer. Uh, but these confessions were sort of unprecedented in literary history because he, he literally just sort of uh, spilled his guts right there on the page and told everything about himself. He didn't hold back any secrets. He told all the worst things he'd ever done. You know, that's why it's called confessions. And his idea was just to experiment and just being honest like this. Let's just say, okay, let's just don't hold back. Let's don't try to make myself look better than I am. Uh, let me just uh, put myself down on paper the way I really am. And that, that kind of, of search for authenticity, of course, uh, was very appealing to a romantic poet like Wordsworth. Um, exactly. But, I mean, isn't it really interesting? What I find here um, interesting is that if you're spelling all that out and that you're um, really getting everything about yourself, the bad things, the good things, doesn't that kind of remove that magical element about the romantic poet? Well, the, I, I think it, it's definitely different from the romantic poets. I mean, the romantic poets are definitely into showing their inner feelings. But again, they do it through a persona, which gives them a sort of little bit of a layer of protection. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. And in addition, they don't, they don't reveal everything. They want to maintain a sort of air of mystery because the idea is that Ultimately, ordinary people could never really fully understand them anyway because you just can't, as an ordinary person, you just can't feel things and see things the way a romantic poet does. Exactly. Um, the evolution of the prelude, um, so the poem evolved over the course of most of Wordsworth's career, like we already mentioned. Um, it has so many forms, and we already mentioned that. Um, the textbook focuses on the early manuscript versions and not the later published ones. So it's like the young Wordsworth rather than the older um, Wordsworth. So um, this focus is an important decision that really favors the younger Wordsworth um, as opposed to the more polished and, you know, mature um, um, Victorian, really, Wordsworth. Um, like we said, um, Professor Booker already noted that like at the end of his life and career, he was kind of really departing from um, uh, romanticism. So I would think that would really show even on uh, in the revisions that he made of the poetry. Um, in Activity 8, pages 31 to 32, there's a comparison uh, of the two versions of uh, this segment in, uh, of, of this poem. In the first version of the poem uh, in your book, uh, you'll see a, a, an early uh, account in which Wordsworth as a young man is remembering an experience he had as a child. So it's not that far in the past that you can still remember it well. And he remembers in particular seeing something that really made an impression on him because it was shocking and horrifying. Uh, and then he remembers the process through which he created an imaginative version of that sight uh, inside his mind that became as real to him as the actual initial physical uh, sight, uh, which itself created what he calls a spot in time, this unforgettable moment that became a focal point for the development of his poetic imagination. So this early version focuses on 
uh, the growth of his imaginative power and how he came to realize that he had a special imagination and, and how this mysterious, inexplicable uh, process is going on to, to develop that imagination. In him. Version 2 is a more studied account of educational development. So it relates the same experience, but now it's from a greater distance in time. Of course, he's like an adult, so he's more mature, and he's looking back at that experience. A more self-conscious, autobiographical look at the evolution of uh, the self through a consideration of this one experience involving uh, fear and death, that focal point that Professor Booker was just talking about. So now the poet is now cast as an adult mourner. He's like mourning and like, you know, uh, the dead child. And who is this dead child? It's him, himself, his younger self. And this is a very good metaphor for the experience of any autobi uh, autobiographer uh, pondering uh, his own now lost earlier uh, self. Um, this is a really interesting um um, experience uh, just because it really in a way kind of I feel like it goes with um, science in that a human being's evol um, evolution uh, really leaves him as a completely different person than he was before um, wh what do you think of that yeah, I, I think it's it's a, a really interesting change in tone from the first poem where he looks at this child and says, oh, yeah, that's me. Uh, and really, in the older version, he basically says, oh, no, that's not me. That, that child doesn't exist anymore. I'm a different person uh, now because I've changed so much over time. And of course, you know, every seven years, every cell in your body is replaced. So exactly. You literally are physically a new person every seven years or so. But... Uh, but especially as you grow from uh, being a child to being an old man, as he does in, in this case, there's going to be dramatic changes. Yeah. And really that child only exists now in his memory. It's just a kind of memory and, and, and in a sense not a real uh, existing person anymore. But my question here is that why mourning the dead child? Why is it a sad moment here? Well, I think it, I think it is a cast as the kind of sad moment uh, because again this is a child this you know he was young he was innocent he was fresh he was excited about the world and now Wordsworth he's thinking you know and now he's old and he's tired mm -hmm. and in a way it's kind of sad that that young vivacious energetic child uh, passed out of existence has ce had ceased to exist he had ceased to exist mm -hmm. as Flaubert would say yeah. All right, now in conclusion, um, remember that we considered two basic approaches to reading Wordsworth's poetry. We have looked at close reading of individual poems in the manner of the new critic, uh, critics, the new criticism school. Um, we also looked at biographical readings, which are perhaps more consistent with how the romantic um, poets would want you to read their poetry and consistent with uh, romantic literature. But we should remember that the self is a complex entity. And I think Wordsworth himself actually knew that really early on, and that is why he spent um, many years revising his poetry. Um, and the poetic person personae are fictions, and there is really no one. Uh, real Wordsworth. You cannot pinpoint and say, oh, so this is the Wordsworth. Oh, so this is the real Wordsworth. There isn't really one uh, aspect that you can pinpoint and say, okay, so this angle is Wordsworth. So Wordsworth can be um, uh, different things. He can be so many um, things, and we're going to see that um, a little bit even taken further when we discuss um, uh, Shelley. Uh, any comments, Professor Booker, before we end this? Well, I, I think in Wordsworth's case, because he had such a long career, you know, he changed more than any of the other romantic poets. Uh, and so he has a special perspective uh, on, on this. 
uh, in the sense that uh, he can look back, uh, you know, from a position that other people can and realize that he himself has not been the same this whole time. And so you get the situation of a poet who puts so much emphasis on the self, suddenly realizing that that's not even a thing that exists. That's not really, there's no self that's words worth. Uh, and it's kind of an interesting uh, recognition in his old age that uh, maybe uh, some of the things that he was doing in his younger days were actually pretty naive. Exactly. That's so true. Um, I just want to thank you at the end for participating in making this um, uh, lecture today. Thank you so well, much. Thank you, for, thank you for having me. Okay. Bye-bye.